Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for clicking on the video as always. I am over on the west coast this weekend and we're gonna have a bit of a, I guess a standard tent camp, but we're, we're heading up into the hills. I'll say a bit more about um, where I am later on in the video. Yeah, I don't wanna talk too much. I'll, I'll get up to the spot, I'll show you where I'm camping, get the tent set up, so at least when the weather comes in, we've we've got some got some shelter. Just come off the main path here to show you something, and this kind of sums up huge areas of the the Northwest Highlands. So we've got this big rock here, which is obviously out of reach of sheep and deer. Now if you look at the rest of this landscape you won't find much more than heavily cropped heather and rough grasses and that's it. But as soon as you remove the grazing pressure this is what you get. I mean you've got some heather there obviously that would still be here naturally but you've got uh, mosses, you've got a bit of blaberry in there, and of course you've got trees. There's actually several trees on this, this rock actually. Now I look a bit closer. Yeah, I can see yeah, there's more blaberry in there at the bottom of the tree. I'm not sure if the uh, camera's picking it up. Compared to the surrounding landscape, a huge amount of diversity in, what's that? Maybe four or five metres squared. And that basically sums up what we're missing across vast areas of this landscape and how much would actually come back if you just remove the grazing pressure. Like I say, this is literally just a bit too high for sheep and deer to get to and that's why it survives. It's, it's as simple as that. I should probably tell you where I am. Uh, I've, I've changed my hat because it's it's definitely not uh, warm up here and the, the wind keeps picking up. So I'm just doing this inside the tent just to avoid uh, any wind noise. As you've hopefully seen from the footage, I am camped on a beach on a small loch and below these um, dramatic bluffs of Bain Van. And that is a mountain on the edge of the Applecross Peninsula over on the west coast. After my last video when I was asking for feedback, I was thinking that really it's one thing for me to sit in a nice place and tell you what's wrong, but I really need to go to the places where something's wrong, you know, for you to actually see it. So, uh, you know, I was talking about some of the things on the, on the way up, you know, you won't you won't see a lot of trees in these kind of places, they really are barren and I mean you probably wouldn't get too much up here because it is incredibly rocky, the, the soils are virtually non-existent, especially further up behind me. But where I, I walked up earlier, 
absolutely. Um, you know, you would get at least, you know, kind of willow, birch, you know, scrubby woodland, definitely something. And then, you know, more mature oak and birch woodland uh, further down. And I mean, you can see there's some woodland still surviving around the estate and the sort of settlements um, down near, you know, Kishorn and these kind of places. Uh, you know, so there's absolutely no problem with trees growing here. And actually on the other side of the glen is a ash wood, like an actual designated ash wood. I think it's a nature reserve actually, National Nature Reserve. It's the oldest and most northerly ash wood in the UK, I think. It's something like five or six thousand years, so it's incredibly old. But the fact that that's just over there and then there's a complete moonscape round about it. When I say moonscape, I just mean, you know, just bare, rocky, there's there's nothing here. Uh, you know, it's it really is because of um, grazing by sheep, deer and uh, burning. It's actually quite nice at the moment. The uh, the wind's died down a wee bit and the sun's out. I'm not going to say it's warm, but pleasant. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be dinner time soon. I just realised I forgot Derek's uh, bowl, but I mean he'll he'll eat off the ground, no problem. Uh, he's not going to starve. But I knew I'd forget something. Alright guys, it's about 20 to 9, um, yeah it's turned out to be a really beautiful still evening but uh, yeah the sky is really clear now and the, the temperature's dropping quite quickly. Uh, the thermometer was saying uh, looks like 1 or, or 2 degrees so yeah it's going to be a, a chilly night but uh, yeah I think we're just going to run, <laughs> run about with the ball here for like 10 minutes get warm and then uh, we'll get into the tent and uh, 
inside our, our sleeping bags. But yeah, I'll call it a day there and we will see you in the morning. Morning folks, oh, I actually slept really well, it's quite a comfortable spot, uh, I think I fell asleep about 10 and then it's 7 o'clock now, I did wake up for about an hour in the middle of the night, not for any reason to do with cold or anything, I just, I just, I just did, <laughs> but I got back to sleep relatively easily. Um, really quiet spot as well like just no no background noise at all oh, yeah. <sighs> one thing you can maybe let me know in the comments is this is my first down bag and it seems to lose a hell of a lot of feathers so between all the sand in the tent because of the dog and the feathers it looks like I've had some kind of <laughs> beach brawl with a chicken it's there's just feathers everywhere so yeah let me in the, let me know in the comments below is that is that just a thing with all down bags or is it just that one The sun did just as I hoped and burned through the cloud and this this mountain behind me looks incredible this morning and to be honest I think you know in this part of the world the 
the geology is obviously incredible. You know, we've got some really impressive mountain formations in Scotland, but in some ways that masks a lot of the ecological damage. So, you know, someone who doesn't who's maybe not from Scotland or who doesn't really understand what's happened here you know they walk up here if they just think it's kind of natural and open and then they see this you know they're not thinking about you know overgrazing or where the trees have gone and all that kind of thing so I think large parts of Scotland almost get away with closer scrutiny from you know people in general because of backdrops like this but like I say, I just wanted to come here somewhere a bit different. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's it's a beautiful spot. I mean, it's you know, a nice little sandy beach along this backdrop. But I realise, especially from the last video, that there's not much point me sitting in some of the best examples we have left trying to explain what's gone wrong. I, I kind of need to get out here and, and show you, you know? and. Like I say, ecologically, uh, this area has just been devastated. I mean, you've seen there's there's not there's hardly a tree in the place. But over in the west coast here, you know, it's it's going to be wetter. There's going to be more exposure. So that natural tree line that I was talking about a couple of videos ago is going to be lower than somewhere like the Cairngorms, which is relatively sheltered. But. I'm only at 350 meters here. I mean, that's that's nothing, um, and I don't necessarily mean you know blanket forest over everything you see, not at all. But there's pockets all over here. I mean, there should be you know scrubby woodland all around this loch and the kind of grassy corry up the back there with the scree slopes. That's perfect for like montane willows, you know, juniper, dwarf birch, that kind of thing, and not far back from where I am here, like I talked about earlier, you know, that should be oak woodland, oak birch, um, maybe even some pines in some areas, uh, but we're just, we're just missing it all, and, you know, it's not just the trees, it's the, the ground flora and the wildlife, I mean, there's, there's nothing here, <laughs> um, you know, people, ask me, you know, are you not afraid to go out to these places on your own? Are you not afraid of wildlife? And I don't think people outside of Scotland understand that we've got nothing left. Uh, the main thing that can hurt me out here is, is myself if I do something stupid. You might see uh, a red deer, uh, you might see a sheep, you might even see the odd raven, but I haven't even seen, seen them this time. So, yeah, it's just... It's pretty depressing, and I've been looking at these landscapes for, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say how long now, but well into my 30s. But yeah, I'm just going to get packed up just now, try and empty this two tons of sand out my out my tent. I'm not going to film any of that. I, I don't have time to hang around, I need to get going. But if you want to stick around for Forest Thoughts, we're going to go about 30 miles that way I think uh, over to Glen Affric and I've just filmed uh, a bit of an update on the the Witch Elm project over there we were out a couple of weeks ago and we did the first phase of planting if you follow me on Instagram or you've read the blog you'll be aware of that already but if not then it'll be it's something new if you do want to stick around and watch that but if not I hope you enjoyed this part of the video and I'll hopefully see you on the next one Hi folks, thanks for sticking around for Forest Thoughts as always. 
We are in a place called Glaunehiche and it's a side glen at the sort of west end of uh, Glen Affric. We're sitting under quite an old and significant tree and we've just completed the, the first part of quite an interesting project related to this tree that I wanted to talk to you about. I've I've blogged about this in the in the past. There's a blog post on the website just now. I've talked about it on Instagram as well, so some of you might be aware. And the the part of the project I'm going to talk about was actually carried out um, two weeks ago, and there was actually quite a lot of media and press attention about it. So you may have seen it on uh, the BBC News or local papers if you're from this area already. Now this tree is known as the last Ent of Afric and I'll explain the name in a minute but it's a, it's a witch elm and it really is uh, the only one of its kind for a considerable distance in this area. You're talking quite a few kilometers before you reach the, reach the next certainly mature uh, witch elm. And in terms of the species status in this glen and local area, this makes this tree incredibly isolated and that's quite important. So remember that point as I talk about this project. But I'll start off by talking a little bit more about witch elm and its, its status in Scotland. So witch elm is also known as Scotch or Scots elm. It's a native deciduous tree, it has quite a, a wide ranging distribution from Norway down to Sicily and from Ireland in the west right across to the Ural Mountains in, in Russia. Depending on where it is, it can be a montane species, you know, growing at elevations to, you know, kind of 1500 metres in, in Europe. And it can also be the dominant species in different woodlands too. There's elm forests in Scandinavia where, you know, it's by far the, the most dominant tree that's there. And in terms of the British Isles, it's more commonly found towards the north and west. And in Scotland, it was, it was most common in the borders, you know, in, in southern Scotland. Of the two elm species we have in the British Isles, it's the only one that's actually been 100% confirmed as native. Um, some people think that the English elm was actually uh, introduced to the British Isles uh, around about the Bronze Age, you know, it didn't, didn't uh, get here naturally. They can reportedly live up to 400 years, but most witch elm remaining here in Scotland are, are much younger than that. Obviously not including the, the tree that I'm sitting under, but as mentioned earlier, it was it was more common in the, the lowlands of Scotland. It doesn't really form a major component of the ancient Caledonian pine woods or um, sort of temperate Atlantic rainforest, but it is widely distributed uh, across Scotland. You'll find it growing as far north as Sutherland. And as a species on its own, it hosts a vast amount of biodiversity so even though there's not many of them uh, the tree itself is you know very important and in, in terms of uh, reproduction the the witch elm is known as monoecious and that basically means that on one individual tree you'll get male reproductive parts and female reproductive parts now the opposite of that is dioecious, which means, you know, an individual tree is either male or uh, female. And although there's male and female parts on the one tree, it has mechanisms in place to avoid uh, self-pollination, you know, pollinating itself. So to produce seed, it needs at least one other individual that's producing pollen within, you know, a reasonable distance of wind dispersal of that pollen to cross pollinate each other to produce that seed. And that's the second important point to remember as I'm talking about this, because this tree is, is so isolated 
it's never it's never going to get pollinated to uh, produce young trees you know the next generation unfortunately most elm of both species um, witch and english elm have been steadily wiped out by dutch elm disease since the, the 1960s in the british isles Dutch elm disease is, is a fungal disease, it's spread by various uh, elm bark beetles and those beetles essentially bore into the, the wood of the tree which allows the fungus to enter the tree it gets into the, the vascular systems of the tree and, and disrupts them you know the systems that uh, carry water and nutrients to and from different parts of the tree and that disruption is enough that eventually um, it kills the tree. So with that in mind, uh, that's what makes this tree quite special as it's been able to hang on out here relatively well protected because it's so far away from any other witch elm and any potential spread of the disease. And the name Last Dent of Afric was actually given to it back in 2019 when it won Scotland's Tree of the Year award. It is basically a reference to uh, the Ents in Tolkien's uh, Lord of the Rings Middle Earth, you know, um, just because of how it looks and how old it is and also because it's, you know, it's, it's the last one here. It's kind of seen as like some ancient guardian, that type of thing. The history of the tree is a little uncertain because it's so unique. We can't really say for certain if it came here naturally or it may have been planted. I've mentioned on other videos before, although this area seems remote these days, it was a fairly busy crossroads from you know west to east and coming in from the south from Clooney. There was people who lived in these glens. You know, there's evidence of settlements all over the place. So it may have been planted, but this location you probably wouldn't pick it for planting a tree. It's basically a pile of, of rock. It's very thin soil on rock. But one thing we are more certain of is that it's definitely centuries old. More than likely, you know, over 350 years old. So it, you know, it's definitely in that ancient woodland um, category. And you can see it's, it's a very old, impressive, veteran tree whether it came here naturally or or not you know it's been here for a long time so on to the project uh, last year i was contacted by emma at royal botanic garden edinburgh and they were getting organized to start their um three-year scottish plant recovery project and that's basically a, a three-year project uh, looking at 10 rare or you know very threatened species in Scotland and it involves you know collecting seed from these rare species creating new populations this kind of thing and obviously witch elm is one of those 10 species now the Scottish plant recovery project is funded by uh, the nature restoration fund and in terms of the witch elm Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh were able to collect seed from mature elm in southern Scotland and these elm have basically been exposed to the disease for maybe 40 years but they're not showing any signs of being susceptible to the disease so they they appear to be resistant to Dutch elm disease and the team there were able to um, collect seed and grow on seedlings to plant out and they were looking for um, translocation sites. Emma already knew about the the elm here and the site around it so after a bit of discussion and planning we decided you know this would be an ideal site for that kind of thing. Uh, I got my team to build this small um, enclosure to protect the trees uh, it's, it's deer fenced, it's got rabbit netting to protect against hares, you know, to give these young trees as much, much of a chance as possible. And this site, not only is it good because of its uh, isolation and remoteness from other, you know, potential threats from the disease, 
if this old tree holds on long enough, and I really hope it does, and uh, these young trees get to an age where they can produce pollen, there's a chance that they could cross pollinate and that would mean that the genetics of this tree would actually be able to, to live on. And I should probably mention what my part in all this is. Uh, I mean, the majority of Glen Affric is owned and managed by Forestry and Land Scotland. I work for Forestry and Land Scotland. I'm the, the forester for uh, Glen Affric in this area. So that's why Emma contacted me for this project. And two weeks ago, Emma and her team brought the first uh, 35 disease resistant witch elm uh, saplings to this site and we planted them and we got we got very lucky with the weather we had a, a really nice morning talking about the project and uh, getting the trees in the ground and essentially we've uh, cleared the cleared a small area of vegetation on top you know there's quite a lot of moss and thick grasses here we would call that screef you know screefing um, to get to the uh, soil below and we literally put the tree plug in the ground firm it in and then each tree is individually recorded you know gps and there's a, a wooden marker with each tree that has a unique code uh, related to that tree and that's all to do with the ongoing uh, kind of research and monitoring that will happen you know on these trees and across you know other sites in the project and that's it really like I said all all the trees are in the ground now hoping that they they settle in well and uh, survive and start to grow on and hopefully join by some more next year and perhaps the year after as well but it's been a, a really interesting project to be involved in you know this is definitely um, the better part of my job these days as you know you know I have a lot of personal interest in this kind of thing too if I can be involved in some way in helping secure the future of you know an important tree species then you know absolutely I'll I'll do as much as I possibly can but I'll leave it there thanks again as always for sticking around and, and listening I'll put links below to the Scottish Plant Recovery Project and a few uh, kind of news articles and different bits about um, the last end of Africa and just, just the project in general if you, if you want to read a bit more. And hopefully I'll see you on the next one.